Up the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera. So um, let's let's go back to this slide that where we stopped last time, yesterday actually. So um, um, I think it was um, right here. Um, so the last thing that we um, did yesterday uh, was um, the, um, the, the, the data type conversion. So we discussed um, different um, um, converting functions available. Um, you know, in the platform, so where you can convert one type of data to another um, um, for the the purpose of um, uh, analysis. So, um, <clears throat> so we do have. Um, so right here. So what you see here is same. Maybe you might find this little bit like confusing um, because um, this is actually it's just the same. Um, um, set of uh, commands that, but we have uh, kind of uh, integrated everything into like you know one line. So, so I have prepared an activity. I mean, uh, to just to uh, show you, um, you know how this pipe operator works. Uh, just just in case, let's say we have this data set right here. So this is the data data set that we have. Um, so which has the ID and then the category, you know, as a factor. So um, what kind of category this this person this uh, person belongs to, and then the the score um, of uh, the each person. So that's what you see here. So in this data frame, so um, so we um, we are going to transform this uh, data. So especially ID. We are not transforming. So, but uh, the category we are transforming as um, characters. So, um, so that's uh, what it's doing right here in the first line right here, and in the second line, um, you are transforming um, again. Okay, actually, ID ID um, as um, integer. So, um, current uh, currently. Um, the, the the data set looks like this. So let's uh, copy and paste this whole thing and then um, go to R and then see how it works. And then I'll explain, you know, what the other thing does. <clears throat> okay. So if we run this, so now we have the data set, which has the ID, um, it's numeric with range of from zero to 10. If you uh, move your mouse like hold um, it over right here uh, and then you would see you know, what, the, what it is actually. So this um, factor with three levels. So ID variable, uh, then you can see it's a um, numeric with range from zero to 10. And then category is a factor with uh, three levels and score is a, a numeric with range um, 70 five to 100, but you don't see any change happening uh, to the data set itself. So, um, because it's just uh, uh, doing that change in the, um, the computer memory, that conversion, like we talked yesterday. So uh, now we are going to transform. So like I said before, we have used a new variable uh, called like data transformed. We usually just keep the original data intact without, um, uh, doing any change because, you know, usually this is like a very simple data set, but um, some data sets are large. And when you do the, like, you know, the process, uh, you know, all the, the cleaning and importing all these processes, you know, it takes time. And you don't want to repeat that, that process in case, in case you made a mistake or something. That's why it's always good to work with the copy of the data set. And uh, so that's what we are doing here. So we are uh, converting the, uh, the category column as characters. So we are converting them to be characters. Um, so if you run the first one, so you would see now the transform data. Uh, so this uh, this is C, it's, it's showing numeric. So uh, this one is showing as character now. So earlier it was uh, uh, factors, right? And this is showing as uh, numeric because we didn't change any of those. 
but you can see the value has not changed. It's not going to do any change to the value. And then now um, we are not going to use uh, data here because if you do it to the data, so then it's, it's going to be like, you know, uh, it's going to make a new copy of this transform data. So what we are going to do is we are going to use the same transform data set and we are going to um, convert ID uh, variable as uh, into integers. Cur uh, yeah, I think it's currently integer, so it may not change anything, but um, let's say it's string, then it, it's gonna be converted to integer, okay? So, and then we print the, uh, the transform data. So you would see that, and if you go there, um, yeah, it's, uh, so an integer, numeric integer. So basically it's a um, numeric, anything numerical. Uh, so integer is basically like uh, uh, whole numbers, right? You know that. And then we also have float. Float has decimal numbers. So, so now since it does not have decimals, so we consider it as an integer. So they all are numeric, okay? So you don't see any change when, we, when you do the computation, they will be considered as uh, integers. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's see, like this is actually um, not, you don't have to know, know this process. So it's actually the same thing, but it's uh, using a different operator just to make things easy. So, um, so what it's doing is actually, uh, it's uh, see now we have multiple variables. Let's see this like intermediate variable that we are creating um, data transformed. And then we have to repeat it, you know, right here and then type it here. And it's kind of not necessary. So we skip all those steps and then we create only one variable called, called data transformed. And we can actually put all these things into one line. So basically, um, this becomes like just like one single line. So where we had all these lines, right? So these uh, um, two lines became one line. So what it does is it's just doing the same thing, mutate. And now we don't have to give that argument, like, you know, the data, because it's actually using, you know, with this, 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 is, uh, this is the pipe operator. It's actually um, coming under DPLYR. Um, and it can also um, be used with any other function. So, um, I mean, in other um, packages, libraries, and and you can see um, um, you we, you don't have to um, manually give the first argument, you know, what the data set is. So because uh, this is basically like, you know, through this pipe operation, this, uh, this is becoming an input to this, no, this command, this command line right here. So we don't have to give uh, that manually. So that's the, the beauty. So some, whoever wrote it, you know, this, uh, this pipe operator, they just manually program it so that, you know, we don't have to type it. And then it's doing the same thing here for the, the mutate, um, um, the next mutate thing, you know, for the ID. So you don't have to use that intermediate, like, you know, that um, repeat this data transformed multiple times because it's just going to be carried over. So this becomes an input um, so to, so this, you know, to this thing. So this is the data set, right? So when you mutate this, this is the, the mutated, you know, the, the data set with the, the changed uh, column. And then it's going to be an input to this uh, step, okay? So it's basically like these two steps, you know, like these two lines are combined and put them into one. And then you just uh, do the same thing. So, so that's what it does. And I mean, you can simply run it and it will show the same thing. It's not gonna like, you know, be any different. So see, it's become characters and this is uh, actually uh, integer now. Okay, so uh, let's proceed to the next step. And um, so here is an activity. Um, Maybe you can try this. So maybe I'll give you a few minutes so that you can um, you can copy paste this and then um, run it in your environment. Okay. Um, Dr. Kosgola, that is slide 66, right? Yeah, so that is slide six. Actually, the slide numbers might have changed, 
So, um, because, um, okay, yes, I think so. So, it's actually... Um, slide 65. Slide, so I think it's slide 65. So, maybe oh. I added this uh, sometime later. So, um, so, maybe I should give this to you. Hold on. So, let me... Um, let me um, share this. I think maybe I um, I added this later. So I oh. think hold on. Did I did I share this? Um, so I think maybe I added this um, um, yesterday. I think I did it. Yes, yes. And Dr. Kusgola, this is the the package is DPLYR, right? Correct. The package is DPLYR. But I'm going to give you this one also because I don't think if I. Um, had it yesterday, like, you know, when I was doing it. So last night, I think I wanted to, when I saw this, I, I realized that I wanted to um, explain what this um, this pipe operator is, like, a little bit. So that's why I, I remember now I added this part. So um, so I'm going to paste it here in, in in the chat. So then you have it. Just to show, you know, what, you know, what the difference you know, between the regular, like, you know, the code and the pipe operator. It's again, it's not really required, you know, it's you don't have to use the pipe operator, you can just use this simple code and that's perfectly fine. It's just gonna do the same thing. Um so, sorry, yes? Gola. I, I have another question. Um I think that somewhere in your slide you mentioned that uh DPLYR is um uh, a function of you know the tidy r t tidy y r. So can if we install that. Uh, install package open and close parenthesis T I D Y R. So will the will it supersede D P L Y R? Do we need to run both? Um. So, so what um what what uh, which one you're talking about? Is that something that I talked about? Uh yes. Because like you mentioned that so right now we're using uh D P L Y R right the package. Correct. Yes. But there's another package called um I, I saw in your presentation that uh DPLYR is a part of TIDYR, the TIDR. Yes, yes, tidyverse, so, yes, yes, correct. So if we put that if we install tidyverse, would we have to install the DPLYR or it's automatically installed? Uh, I don't think tidyverse has everything that's in DPLYR, so it's kind of an addition. So, oh. so, so you uh, tidyverse has a lot of functionalities. I know I, I strongly believe that you need to use a DPLYR itself. So tidyverse has some ad additional, uh, some other like you know extensive packages, but this is an extension, another extension uh, to to tidyverse. So because tidyverse is like a big um, group uh, that they work on all these um, um, packages. So yes, tidyverse is one package. So I, uh, the thing is like some of these things are repeated. So tidyverse also has um, some of these functions, but it may be like slightly different. So so it's better to just use DPLYR if you want to just uh, use my line, I mean, my command. But I'm sure like, you know, tidyverse also has similar you know, functions, but not everything that we have here. DPLYR is like, you know, specifically for you know, all the things that I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Welcome. And let us know, guys, if you are having problems running the the syntax so that before we move on. And uh, just as a quick reminder, so um, you also have to remove the bullet point. And anything with the hashtag at the beginning, it's a statement. So it's not the syntax. It's telling you, like Dr. Kusgola is telling you, like, what it's for. Okay. So maybe let's give them a few minutes and let us know in the chat if you guys have any sure. concerns or questions. Okay. Um, can we get a thumbs up if you guys were able to run the syntax successfully? Let's wait for a few more minutes. I'm not seeing anything. Okay, okay. That's good. So no no one has encountered any problem. We can move on. 
Okay, all right. So thank you. Um, and um, so uh, now um, this is uh, something you might need, you know, that some, some researchers might need, need to change um, some um, string variables, uh, content, you know, of uh, certain um, string um, columns. So um, this is not like widely used. I haven't personally used this um, at all, but uh, just for the sake of completion, I have uh, included it and you might, who knows, you might need it, right? So let's, uh, uh, let's see what it is. So this is actually capable of uh, um, manipulating you no know, strings. So string is, you know, like we have strings everywhere, right? So we just type words, sentences, uh, uh, you know, characters, uh, letters, their string, right? So that's, uh, it's a different uh, um, data type. So we, we need to have um, uh, different uh, um, functions um, to, to manipulate. So to change things uh, in the data set that are uh, stored as strings. So um, it's it's very easy to use this. So one thing is con concatenation. So basically like, for example, let's say that you have two columns uh, giving one person's first name and then the last name, and you need to make a new column um, with you know uh, co combining first name and the last name. So then you can use concatenation, okay? So um, this is a very simple example. So how to do that? Um, um, so let's see like this is, um, we don't have to run it now, we'll run it later, but string C, like, you know, str is for string and then underscore C, C is for concatenation. So it's coming under this string R, you know, uh, package. This, uh, this is the library that can see we have, if you don't have it installed, you may have to install it. And then um, you use uh, the function and then these are the arguments. So you have to give the words, uh, the first uh, set of words and the second set of words. And then um, you have to give the um, the separation, you know, how you separate it. Okay, so if you run this, you know, this is going to print hello world. Okay, so um, that's concatenation. And then extraction, in case you have to extract something from an existing um, uh, text, uh, so we can use this uh, sub sub function. Um, so it's like substring extraction. So basically, what it's doing is like we we can extract um, whatever the content. Let's say if you want to extract just like you know world. So you have to um, you have to find you know what characters are like you know let's say the first character is H, second character is E, and then third one is L fourth one is uh, L and then uh, fifth one is O, right? So then if you say it's one to five you know, characters, then it's gonna extract hello. So if you say it's like, um, then so let's say six, seven to whatever this number, then it will extract um, whatever that you are signing, okay? So this number one to five. So basically it's the index of the character. First character, this is uh, first character, second character. So it's asking you to extract char first character, starting from first character, going to fifth character. So which is actually hello, okay? So uh, you may need this in case you need to, let's say just extract, uh, you know, the certain uh, no, um, uh, characters from um, a string variable. And then pattern matching. Um, so here, what we do is like, we try to find patterns in strings using um, this, um, this function. So, um, so str detect. So this function can detect whatever the, um, um, the, the pattern that you're looking for here. Um, the pattern that we're looking for is world. So it's gonna search through this, like, you know, this, uh, this text and then find if the, this, this pattern is there. So it is there, so it's gonna return true, right? So we can try all these things uh, in a few minutes. And then pattern replacement. Um, 
So you can replace, let's say we identify a pattern, we can also replace it. So it's actually doing both here. So in, in, in hello world, you identify if world is there, if world is there, if, if the world is there, it's gonna be replaced with universe. So you can see um, that's being done here. Um, these are really simple operations. So we have this whole example. All of us can copy paste and run this. And before that, let me explain this, okay? I'm gonna take a minute uh, to explain um, this. Um, we had it earlier, I mean, um, in the other um, slides, but I have the whole thing here now. So the first one is actually doing the um, the con um, concatenation, right? Uh, so, so we have all these uh, strings. Uh, let's see, like, um, this is actually to show how to create a list of strings, okay? So I think I did not have that included, but uh, you can create a list of string. It's the same way of creating any list, okay? So here, if you click on this thing, no, um, run button, you will see the li a list of string is being created. So if you just double check and then run it, I mean, double click and run it, and then you will see hello world, um, data science with R string is uh, powerful, right? So you can see um, we we have a, um, an, an array of strings, right? So if you want to search through this and then find some, um, uh, some uh, characters, or uh, some text and then change things, then you can do that too. So, but uh, this is the simple operation that I explained, you know, concatenate. So you can um, combine these two strings and then um, um, and then print it. And then you will see what uh, it's gonna show you. So initially there like you no know, two separate words, but now it becomes one, you know, sentence like hello world. Okay, so um, that's, Combined, the separation is uh, um, just a space bar. Um, and then, sorry, yeah, sorry, Doctor Yeah, yeah yes. and there's a question here. So, like, um, how do you save the syntax and the results? Is it automatically saved in the history tab? Uh no. So you have to um, save it. See, like, I usually delete everything, but if you want to save it, so you have to go to file. Um, and then do save. But in my case, it's already saved here. But if you want to save everything, you know, let's say whatever I, we are doing here, um, you may have to like, you know, do save as, if you mm -hmm. want to separ separately save them. Let's say like this is string, you no know, string um, R or whatever you want to, however you want to use it. So then, then just this section will be saved. If you don't save it manually, it's not going to be saved. But in my case, I'm just clearing up everything because you know I just want to have a nice, uh, clean environment so that you won't be confused. That's why I do it. But if you want to save everything, you have to manually do that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So and then this is the extraction. So. Let's try that. Um, so here, so we are extracting characters uh, between one and five, actually starting from one to five. So if you print that, you can see hello is being extracted. So if you change this to like um, six to 10, then it's gonna extract uh, world uh, maybe. 11, okay. It's it's extracting now world. So you can see that. So um, yeah, it's very simple. Um, so now you see strings. So these are the strings that we created. So this object, right? So now we are gonna search for world, if there's world here. So pattern detect. So, uh, and if it's there, it's gonna print, right? Print, it's gonna say true or false. That's what it's gonna print and pattern detect, it's true. In the first, right here, right here in the first uh, um, uh, uh, first one, you know, uh, you have a world and in the second one, you don't have world. And the, the, the third one, you don't have world. So you can see this um, um, in, the, in this array, 
um, you only can find you know in in the uh, in the first one you know so so you uh, world so that's where you see like true false and false okay and then uh, pattern replacement so um you can replace world uh, with universe you find if world is there it's going to be replaced with uh, universe so let's try that and then you print it and now it's saying hello universe instead of world right so these are like very simple uh, string operations that you can use okay um so now you can run this and see i can give you a couple of minutes a few minutes um and see if it's um, working for you and if you already have done it then we can proceed Okay, so I'm assuming you managed to do it. So let's um, move on. So now working with dates and times using this package, you can see like you will find hundreds and thousands of packages uh, developed by a lot of people. And some packages pretty much like, you know, they can, I mean, do the same thing that other packages can do. So it's just uh, like, you know, some people did a lot of work and you might find you will have a lot of choices okay you may find another like 20 30 different packages i mean when i say packages they're also libraries um uh, so you you will see like you know you can do this this date operations and anything that we talked about in in other packages using different functions okay so you don't have to memorize anything you just have to use something that's um, that's useful for you Okay. Okay. So what it does is actually we can we can assign the the dates. So sometimes you know I don't know if you have to use dates in your um in your um, data. So you might have to sometimes you know uh, some data come um some some data sets come with um, timestamps. Uh, you know the the date that is being recorded time uh, also included sometimes so you may need uh, that information uh, for your um, analysis just to make sure like you know what date it's being done and it may also include someone's birthday right so in different format so you may you might have to um, deal with that you know finding um, converting that uh, uh, that into correct format basically when you import you know, it's probably going to be in a like you know really like you know character format or maybe string format. However, it's going to be imported. So that's why you have to get it into the correct um, data data form um, format. So so that that's dot data the correct data type. So in order to do that, you you have to use um, a package that's going to identify and then the define define dates properly then so, we as we know already like dates um, are being you know um, uh, used i know the, the the format of date uh, is different right it's just multiple formats that's uh, that's being used especially you know in the us um, we use like month uh, date and then year so but uh, i know the, the rest of the world prefers like you know the date month and year so um so but you might see you know year month and date there's many different form formats uh, of um, the date so but either um uh, either way so you will find functions that can you not know, work with any um, any kind ymd so it's actually year month date and month date 
an ear. So this is what we use here. And then this is what a um, lot of people use in other countries like date, month, year. And um, any format can be handled. So you basically have to use uh, this library. And then if you prefer having your dates, you know, in this format, uh, year, month, and date. So you have to give it like this, and then it will be uh, stored as uh, the date. So if your data, you know, itself is coming like this, then you can use uh, this YMD function to recognize it as a, a date. Otherwise, it won't be recognized what this thing is. So it could be anything, right? It could be someone's social security number or something. So unless you use this uh, YMD function, uh, it won't be recognized, right? So this is initially, it's gonna be a set of characters. And then if you use YMD, it's actually gonna be recognized as um, date, a date. So the same goes here. Um, you can see YMD and HMS, like uh, hours, minutes, and seconds, and MD, Y, and HMS. So this could be a potential timestamp, you know, of a survey response. So you might have to just, um, maybe extract the year day, I mean, maybe the year, um, just the, the, this YMD, not hours, minutes and seconds. You can do those things, but first you need to really identify this as um, a timestamp, uh, timestamp which is in the format of YMD HMS. So then you use this function to do that. And once you have that ready, you can um, do the, the further um, processing for this uh, timestamp. Okay, that's where this um, uh, date arithmetics come in. So where if you want to change dates, you know, add and add add year, add, add years and add dates, add dates, and you can add months or subtract, and those things can be done um, by um, using these functions. So you basically have um, you see first you identify that you no know, this date as uh, in, in YMD form, uh, format, and then you add one year. So you just have to use years, and then within parentheses, you just give one or two or however the amount, uh, number of years that you need to add. And then subtract dates. You can do anything that you wanna do uh, with these dates, okay? Um, and then, so these are basically like, converting your date into like some sort of a standard, you know, formats, like August 1st, 2023. Now we, we use this format when we write like letters and, you know, when we, um, you know, when we sign, you know, in places we use this, right? So you can use this uh, standard um, um, character recognition. So basically this is actually like this percentage sign and B is gonna identify a month uh, in you know in actual like you know uh, string form, and then the day is uh, right here, percentage sign and D, it's going to be the month uh, the date in uh, you know in zero one zero two that format okay zero to thirty one, and then year is uh, the whole year twenty twenty three, or whatever the year so it's with four uh, numbers, so these are the standards I mean I know. Python also uses pretty much the same thing and, and many other languages also use the same thing. So if you do, like, you know, if you type this, so format and then date and your date is right there, right? Previously we had the date here, right? So this is our, this is our date, right? So this will be um, uh, formatted into this form right here. So now the format is gonna be this with this uh, operation. Okay. Dr. Kasbola. Yes. If I may just add, so I, I think like for us, it's useful like um this this data reformatting if you are doing like, let's say uh, multi-level modeling, like if you are uh, gathering data for uh, daily diary or you're, you're comparing, let's say cross-cultural, like let's say for example, um, Sri Lanka in Philippines, uh, the Philippines, the way that we write, dates and numbers would be different so or if you're doing rct that needs this information so that's the thing oh there's another question if the syntax is case sensitive um syntax means uh ymd yeah. or yeah, the... yeah the library i don't think so right 
Yeah, so so let's let's try. So let's change it and see. Like we, you know, the thing is, these are the things that you can try. So so these are, I mean, these are really good questions. So let's let's go ahead and see what's going to happen now. So let's see. Like okay, library. And now I'm gonna like you know, I have the library. Let's change the first letter, capital, and let's see what it's gonna do. See, um, it is case sensitive. So oh. the library is case sensitive. So, so you have to use the correct cases. So in uh, in here, so if there are some languages it's not really case sensitive. So, um, but here, if I change it to you no, know, yeah, to you no know, the lower case, it it accepts. But if you put upper case, it cannot handle it. So it won't recognize. So and then then same goes. Uh, let's try this also. So now we ran this and let's change this to like, you know, YMD and see if it's gonna run. No, see like uh, all these functions and then, you know, the libraries there um, quite um, case sensitive. You have to use the correct um, the case. So these, they are good questions actually. So you, uh, you can always try, you know, change it and so it's not gonna break anything. So don't worry, you can just change and see if it's gonna work. If not, change it back, okay? Yeah. And I think there's another good tip, like for the library, right? If you type library and then like you type your, like if you just type it and then the, the other options will actually come up like like the packages and stuff, right? So you can just click that and then type again, what are you looking for? The first few letters and it would actually give you the choices and the options. So you don't have to even type the entire thing. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, that is right. Yes. So in my case, now I'm just copying, right? So see, like when, when I switch the drop down, so you can actually click on that. So, and then see, it's give, showing you, you know, what, uh, you know, what is actually included. So in the, you know, the arguments are included, you know, in that library things, you can see there's lots of arguments, but you don't, you don't, you hardly use all these arguments. So you just basically use like one argument, but uh, you can see these people who developed this, they thought a lot about these functions and they have added so many arguments and a lot of functionalities. So, but um, people don't use that. Like uh, Verna said, you know, we, this, uh, so when you type it, you know, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you. So you just don't have to type it manually. So it's just gonna pop up, you know, that automatically, so some um, recommendations. So then you can just um, select it. So it's easy to program that way. So if you select like YMD, so you have to give, the, the your string you know whatever the format and then quiet false and tz null so some of these things i haven't even explored what they are so but if you go to the user manual you will see what it says locale uh, you know these things truncated so you can explore what all these things mean i did not explore all this because you know you just don't need it you know you just need the basics so but you don't have to know everything you just you don't know and also have to remember everything it's impossible to remember every single function that you say every day and what their arguments and that's why you have all the user manuals so you can simply go to the correct library search that and then find the function and it will show you everything okay okay uh there is let me just comment on this there is an there is a request for us to give an example with a real data set. I will uh, give you a website wherein you can actually play with a real data set. So there's a NIDA data share, um, but I was thinking of downloading it for you, but there are forms to be filled out and just to be safe, um, you guys can actually select that. But I would, um, if you guys actually have available data sets, that would also be good so that you can practice. Ideally, just select like, respondents with 100 or more so that you can see like the, I mean, the, the usefulness of R. Yes, and you also mentioned an, uh, about another data set that you uh, wanna, so is there anything that uh, we need to talk about or just you wanted to let us know that, you know, this is uh, something that's useful? Uh, yes, um, I have the cheat sheet. I was able to see the one that was shared by my, my professor in regressional, like, Several years ago, I will send it to everyone. Um, I was looking for a data sheet that we use that we I know it's from a public domain with regards to um, attendance in AA plus uh, well-being and the likes. But 
Um, my files are all CSV for M plus, so I don't have the the, the top most file anymore. So I don't know which data that is. So okay. Yeah, so that's why I, I'm looking for a replacement. So that's why I found the NIDA data share, which I will share with everyone in an email. Um, immediately to today, like we might not be able to share the recording because it sorts of um converts. The video needs to be converted for the YouTube uploading, but I can share you the materials like immediately after our session ends today. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's uh, that's really helpful for everyone. Okay, so um Let's proceed to the next section. Are we there? Okay, right here, okay. Um, so yes, we can try these things one by one. So, um, but again, um, uh, it's it's really simple. So let's, let's go to the activity. I think it has everything. So this is um, a very simple example. So where you can con do this data conversion, data conversion. So let's do this. So it's not a really great example like you know, Verna is talking about, but uh, this is just for you to practice, okay? Okay, hold on. Okay, library, run that. And this is, um, let me clean all this. Okay, um, so now let's run this and see what this data set is. So it has only five observations, ID, date, and also this uh, date time with the with, no date with the timestamp. You can see that. So let's see what we do with this, um, this um, dates and times. So pa um, pass the date string. So first, um, what you're doing here is, you know, you just, um, pass it as the, the correct identifier, recognize that as a, um, a date, right? So that's what you're doing. So now if you run this, it will create a new column uh, and then you will see the date. This date column is passed to um, the correct uh, date column. So it's saying unknown, but it's actually the correct date column, okay? So uh, here you can see they're in characters. So this, when they're in characters, it cannot do much. So you cannot uh, do any data processing, but now past date is actually um, uh, a proper date, okay? And then uh, here you are doing the same thing for date time. So now you can see they're just characters and then you, you are gonna pass it um, to a um, date time format. So then you will see that's also being added here, okay? In the, in the correct format. Um, and then, um, now we can do the, the correct you know, date time operations arithmetics to these new data like you know, columns, these ones, okay. the ones that we created. Okay, so let's run the first one. Um, so we are adding another year. So the same date next year, right? So if you run this, it will add um, a new column uh, with the, the new years. So, without changing the date and the month and the date, okay? Okay, so it's done, so it should be there. See, the next year. So it should only add like, you know, one year to this past date column. And then you subtract one month uh, from the past date column, and then you get that, you know, the, uh, uh, into the previous month um, column. You will see that also here previous month. So this is actually one month behind this past date. And then um, this is to format the date uh, into this, um, you know, um, this standard format. Okay, so uh, we use past date column and then format into um, this, um, this standard format that people uh, typically use. So you can see that's being done here. So formatted date, August 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Okay, so that's a very simple task. So you can simply use, uh, practice using the data set that, that you will get you know, uh, from Werner, and then uh, you can uh, proceed with it.
Okay. All right. So that's uh, that's the end of this section. So let's uh, move on um, to the the next section. Okay, so now um, our data uh, is um, quite clean, right? So we did all the the initial operations. You know, we imported the data. We did all the the pre-processing um, steps. So assuming that you know we have all the like you know columns that we need, everything is ready, and, and we can easily um, go into the next step and do our data analysis. So what we usually do. That's the first step is actually just to, um, explore the data. We just see what we have in the data. So um, we need to know, you know what kind of data we have, right? So we have to understand um, what the descriptives are. So this is like the first step, see how many people you know are uh, at this stage, at this stage, what's the representation of the demographics and, and how many people responded like, you know, this way, that way, and you know what? What are the mean values? What are the um, what are the the standard deviations? So you know how things change, right? So across groups, um, um, let's say male versus female, female, right? How things change. So these are like basic descriptive statistics. Some people uh, even get publications from descriptive statistics because they could be really um, informative. So they, they, it could be one thing that you know that you can find that could be your uh, final result. Some people say, okay, so between male versus and female, you know, this changes, and that could be your hypothesis. You're done. So there are some publications people uh, do um, just with the descriptive statistics. So this is actually a very important um, process because you know if you, if your data you know to, you know just explains that uh, through uh, descriptive statistics, it talks by itself, um, then we don't have to do any complicated analysis. So um, then you could be done if you can, if you're 100% sure. But there's always some improvements that you can do uh, uh, with further modeling. And if you if you want to explore more, that's, that's going to be the next step. But you usually do not, we do not proceed to advanced steps without doing the descriptive statistics. Okay. Oh, there's a question on, there are many packages. How can we know which one to use? Are there references? Mm. Yeah, so uh, it's like, um, I don't know how to explain. So it's like basically, um, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know that either because I don't know what I have to use. So I have to select the correct package. So basically, first you need to know, um, you know your, your scope of your work. What do I need you know, from R, right? So you need to clearly delineate your, um, you know, your tasks, you know, this is, this, these are my objectives. This is what I need to get done, right? So then you're just gonna go out then shop, you know, it's like, it's like buying, you know, something, you know, for yourself, buying a car. These are my requirements, and you just go out and see what's there, right? But in these cases, everything is free. You can just use whatever is there, try it out. Also, so you just have need to know what 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 you need, right? What you have to do, what what you do, what do you expect through this analysis, and then you just explore different packages. We can search if you can Google, you know, like. Um, like do like you know, uh, let's say descriptive statistics in R, and it will show you the packages that you can. I mean, descriptive descriptive. You can just use the base package. You don't need any other packages. But there are some fancy tools available in other packages. You can like you know generate fancy kind of descriptive statistics. But you don't. It's again. It's up to you. So what kind of like you know. Uh, a car that you need, you need something fancy, you need something like basic. So it's um, it's hard to decide if you don't know what you need. So you could get lost, you know, looking for things and you will find hundred different things and you don't know what to use. But I think you, you if you know, you know what you need and then if you find something, you can just stick to it. And maybe we have to make sure, you know, it, it can 
do what you want to do. That's it. So I, I, I mean, I cannot say, okay, you, you need, you don't need to have a, like, you know, a cheat sheet saying that, okay, saying that, okay, if you want to do this, use this package. If you want to do this, use that package, you know, packages change with time, you know, and then, you know, they change their functionality. So that may not even be applicable. There could be some other better packages that can be used to do uh, what you're doing right now. So things change, things evolve with time. So just, um, be flexible you know that's what i would say and then you know as just select what you want as you go i think that would be the best uh, thing you know there's there's no like really hard and fast rule for this it's because there's lots of people who contribute to, the, to develop these packages uh, you spending their time um and you know contributing to the world you know by developing these things um uh, and then you know there's also um lots of uh, packages like that okay yes sir um sir before you continue can you please share with them the powerpoint presentation for this uh, lecture oh yes i forgot yes let me do that i'm gonna stop sharing for a second and then i'll share it Okay. All right. So you should have it now. Um, I Yeah, it's it's in the chat. So let's give them just one minute to be able to download it. Okay. So, and let us know, guys, when you're ready to move on, can you just give us a thumbs up, please? Thank you. Okay, I think we're okay. Okay, all right. So let's sir. proceed. Can I proceed? Yes, please, sir. Okay. So, so summary statistics give you a quick overview of main characteristics of the data set. Okay, so usually they include mean, median, mode, range, variance, and standard deviation. So that's what a typical descriptive you know, table. Now usually any publication, they, if you use a data set, any publication, um, um, you know, any um, uh, publication will ask you to provide descriptives because people can get an idea of you know, what, what the distribution of the, your observations are by looking at these things to get a sense of your um, results and then your findings, okay? So first, let's see how to calculate mean. I think we did this earlier also. It's very simple. Um, um, you can just use um, this mean function, which is simply available in the R, like, you know, base package. And then you have, you know, data set, and then you give the variable name, that's it. And then um, median, you can use median function to find um, the median of the data set. So it's the middle value of data set when it's ordered, okay? So, and for mod in R, there is no built-in function in R base to compute uh, uh, mod. So here is a function that you can use uh, to compute the, the mod. We'll explore that later, okay? So we, th 
thankfully we we learn what the functions are and we kind of have a basic understanding um, of uh, how function works right so you may be able to wrap your brain around this but it's not necessary you just have to use the the function you can see mod function it's a custom function it's the same way you just give the function name and then yeah, assign your variable right here as an argument that's it <clears throat> and then range you can find the range which is actually the difference between the mini maximum and the minimum value uh, of a given uh, column using this range function okay these are really simple things and then the variance so it's measure of the spread of the data set so you can find variance using var function and then sd function is there to find the standard deviation which is actually the square root of the variance Um, and then let's uh, go to an example. For some reason, I have multiple you know, slides that's being repeated. My apologies, sir. for some reason, you no. Know, when I did this, you know, I must have made uh, multiple copies of some um, of these slides. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but just keep them. You don't you don't have to go through all that. Okay, so um, so here um, we are going to use data set empty cars, okay? And then we can calculate um, mean, median, um, mod, range, variance, and standard deviation. And then we just put them into a data set here. So that's what um, we are doing here. We can also just simply print it. I can just show you. So now the, the data, this, this is that very simple data set that we have been using, that inbuilt data set. Uh, so mean, we just compute the mean and then you can double click on it and then see what the mean is. Mean MPG is 20 miles per gallon. So in on these cars, an empty cars, so you can see that mean value, um, uh, MPG, it's right here, 21 and all these numbers, it's actually 20, the mean value, okay? And then the median, let's see what median is. So median, it's actually showing it's 19.2. And, and then mod, this is the mod function. Let, let's uh, execute the function and introduce that function to the computer, and then let's use it now. So if you compute the mod, it's 21, okay? And then range, you can see range, you can use that in build function. Um, that is gonna be 10.4 uh, to 33.9, that's the range, okay? Minimum is 10.4, the maximum is 33.9. And then the variance of MPG, it's all about MPG, okay? We are just using that column, finding you know these statistics of uh, um, you know, of the, all these columns. And variance of MPG is 36.3, and the standard deviation is actually uh, 6.02. It's actually the square root of a square root of uh, um, uh, variance, right? And then summary statistics is we are creating a data frame um, which includes all these um, um, findings. So you can do that and then you can just print that and you will see um, mean, median, mod, range, variance, and standard deviation. You can create tables um, like this and everything should be in a tabular form. When you, uh, when you put descriptives, provide descriptives, you have to give the tabular uh, form, okay? All right, so that's, um, that's easy. So um, this, um, other packages, lots of other packages available. If you have a, a big data set and if you want to um, compute this descriptives um, for everything, you know, at once, you know, for all the, the variables, there's other functions that, that are available. 
or you can this uh, use the same function and then put it into loops and do that if you if you are comfortable with programming but you don't have to do that you might be able to find uh, multiple functions that you know in multiple packages even i think dplyr has uh, probably has some of these things or tidyverse has it so i'm not quite sure you know what package would provide those descriptives so now um, so you you can you can look into those things and and get those things done okay so um but it's it's quite easy so um explore um, other packages and then see um how to do uh, it for the entire data set okay and then frequency um, tables and then cross tabulations so this is also important you just have to get an idea you know of the distribution of the the, the frequency let's say for example you know if you have categorical you know um, variables so you need to know how many people's like you know rated you know five in one to five scale and how many people rated like you know one in one to five scale. Likewise, you can get a rough idea of uh, these frequencies. And we can also use uh, cross tabulation to see you know, how the responses vary um, between some groups. So that's where you know, this, these things are helpful um, just for you to get an understanding of how things happen. Sometimes when you explore your research, you may need to see these frequencies, like especially to uh, when say like you know, let's say like you have a hypothesis you know before you do thorough studies you can actually use these frequency tables cross tabulations and these trips to to even decide if this is worthwhile of doing you know you might be able to say this probably won't work because we don't see a difference let's say you are gonna see like you know a different um outcome between male versus female and that was your initial hypothesis but when you run these frequency tables cross tabulations and descriptives you see the, there's no significant difference so we, there's no point of spending time doing all this uh, sophisticated work so let's look for another alternative so that's why this is really important as a time saving thing to make sure your data really speaks um, um, to your hypothesis okay properly so otherwise um, you need, may need to change your um, hypothesis uh, or maybe research question um, so without uh, wasting your time. So this will be really helpful uh, in the beginning because these are really quick things that you can do, okay? Um, so let's see how to get the frequency table. It is really, really simple. You just use table. So this is... Um, uh, I think this is a base package, you know, in base package, you just use this table and other packages also have this, um, many other packages, but base package also includes this table function. So, uh, for example, uh, in the data set, uh, if you use this table function um, to get, you know, to get the frequencies. So let's see uh, empty cars, cylinders. So if you go to cylinders, um, how many cylinders? So you will get how many cars that have, you know, six cylinders and then four cylinders, eight cylinders. Likewise, it will give that uh, tabulated uh, result right here. So you can see there are seven cars with four cylinders, six, uh, seven cars with six cylinders and uh, 14 cars with eight cylinders. That's what it gives. So this is the, uh, the frequency table. can see how simple it is, right? And then um, cross tabulations. So the, uh, it creates a contingency table of cylinders versus gears. So, so let's see how it works. You know, this is where you decide, okay, is there a difference between you know, these uh, two types of um, um, cylinders and gears? So you know, what, what is the distribution of the, the population, right? So you can see that. Here we go. So you can see, you know, here it's showing the gears, right? Um, three, four, five, and then cylinders are given here, four, six, eight. So there are, there's only one car with, you know, four, um, three gears and four cylinders. And, and then there's only, there's eight cars with, you know, four gears um, and then, um, and then four cylinders. Likewise, you can um, tabulate this and see how it uh, how it works. So basically, 
uh, with this, you may even get an idea, like if is if is there a relationship between um, cylinders and gears, and if it is even worthwhile testing it, if there's a good distribution, and and then um, then proceed uh, to the next steps. Okay, so this is one simple example. Um, let's try this. Please um, copy paste this and run and then you will be able to see what it's uh, uh, giving you. So please, I'll give you a minute and then you can run it. Okay, all right, I, th I think you probably managed to do that. Um, so the next um, next thing that we are going to talk about is um, correlation analysis. So um, correlation analysis, you know, we basically just find out, you know, the, the Pearson correlation here. Um, so this is also going to show you, give you some sort of a, a an understanding of your um, hypothesis, you know, your research questions. Um, and then also identify if there are variables that are really like highly correlated um, and, and what variables are highly correlated highly and what variables are not correlated at all. So depending on that, you can even make a decision, you know, you, you, you thought that, you know, there's a relationship between you know, gender and, um, you know, let's say like substance use or something. And then through this correlation analysis, you might be able to see if there's a relationship roughly, right? So uh, without doing any further um, um, modeling. So then you can decide, okay, so this may not be right. So what I'm saying, so you can go ahead and try to run an advanced model and see if it's still just to confirm, but uh, through this, you can verify that. So, um, so this is the next step. Okay, so so basically the correlation analysis measures the strength and direction of the relationship between two variables, right? So um, in statistics, if the correlation coefficient, uh, usually it, it's going between negative one and uh, positive one, right? So it's minus one and plus one. Um, so one, uh, you know, they indicates uh, like, you know, um, uh, negative one indicates a perfect negative correlation, and then um, positive one indicates the perfect positive correlation. And zero means there is no correlation at all. So if any number that's closer to zero indicates a, a weak correlation between those two variables, right? So we use the, the Pearson correlation coefficient. We don't have to compute it. You know, there's a formula that you can use to compute uh, these correlation functions. But like I said before, uh, that all that hard work is done. We don't need to do any of that math. It's hidden behind these functions. We just use them. So now these, these types of analysis are really accessible to so many people, so which is really nice. And then you just use this correlation uh, C O R. Okay, so this is the function for correlation. So you have to give uh, the first variable x variable, and then the second variable is y variable. So it's going to be the correlation between uh, this x and y. So first variable x variable is m p g, and then y is uh, the the horsepower h p. So if you run this, it will give the correlation between these two variables. Okay, so it is actually negative. 
um, 0.77. Okay, so you can imagine what kind of a correlation it has, right? So MPG versus horsepower, right? So it's going to be negative. All right. So um, what is next? So you can also get the correlation of all the numeric variables in your data set just using the same function. So you, instead of uh, uh, giving X and Y variable, you just put the name of the data set and it's going to give you a matrix. So remember matrix is two dimensional. So it's going to show you, you know, um, columns and, and rows both. So this right here. So this is showing you the correlation matrix. Okay, so it's in matrix format. You will see um, equal number of columns and rows here. Okay, and the diagonal is gonna be always one because it's the same variable, okay? MP, MPG versus a correlation between MPG and MPG is just always one, right? And then you can also see other um, correlation. So basically you need to understand um, um, variables that have really um, high correlation. So um, we also address some of these multi-collinearity issues in data um, you know, analysis. So we have to identify such variables who are really highly correlated. When they're really highly correlated, it might indicate some sort of a multi-collinearity. So there's ways of identifying, not just with the correlation matrix, we can, there are advanced methods to determine the multi-collinearity also. So yeah, so when you learn like, you know, those advanced topics and you do the statistics properly, you will see these things become handy. Yeah, so we already talked about this, what they mean. Um, now we can also visualize, you know, you can see how this, like, you know, this matrix, you know, you know in a visual form, like in a heat map. So let's do that. Um, so for that, you need this correlation plot library, okay? So you may have to install that. So remember to install a function, um, uh, sorry, install a package, you have to type install, and then it will show you, see, install packages right here. And then you have to type this C-O-R-R -R plot within um, codes. And then it will start installing. In my case, already it's installed. I'm not gonna do that. And then let's see the correlation plot. It's gonna be, it's right here. Okay, so you can see, um, um, this uh, the scale, you know, this color bar shows the negative and the positive, you know, high correlation. So if it is uh, red, um, dark red, that means, you know, negative, uh, highly negatively correlated. And then if it is like um, dark blue, they're highly positively correlated, right? So you can get an understanding. If you also, by looking at this correlation plot, plot you can uh, get an idea, idea of your research uh, questions and your hypothesis you man you can even redefine your hypothesis you know if you see something that's like uh, highly correlated that you never thought that could be an interesting research area that you can explore so these are really good things you know, tools that you can use um, to um, really streamline your um, research okay so yeah, these things we already discussed. And now let's practice this. Uh, I'll give you a few couple of minutes to copy paste and run this. Okay, make sure you installed um, a correlation plot. You may not have it, okay? So everything else is there. You don't have to reinstall any other package, but this um, uh, library uh, correlation plot, plot package must be installed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Janaka? Like after yes. we have that, that exercise, can we have a 15 minute break? So like while they're running it, then let's wait. If they encounter any issues or concern, please put it in the chat box. We'll respond to that and then we'll have a break. So you can have your bathroom break and water break as well. Okay. All right. Let's do that. So yeah, um, so um, you want to do it now? Um, maybe after they run this, uh, the last pro the last activity on slide number 
Um, 39, that's correct, right? Yeah, it's 39, yes, that is correct, yes. Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes. I highly encourage you to get a practice data set and then um, do these things by yourself, you know, um, and then you will understand. And these things are really helpful to anybody because uh, sometimes we think, you know, these things are related, right? But in maybe in data, it's not represented. If, if it's not reflected in your data, then you cannot uh, prove that, right? So in your research. So what maybe your hypothesis is wrong. So you can go and, you know, kind of uh, fix your hypothesis in if something is wrong. And if, it's, if it aligns with your research um, goal, then definitely you can um, look into that. I mean, you can tell a lot of stories just by looking at this, you know, miles per gallon and you know, number of cylinders. This is why, you know, some cars, you know, really fast driving cars don't have a high gas mileage. You have to spend a lot of money, right? If you buy a, a Ram or like, you know, a truck, or maybe if you buy a Toyota Corolla, you can see the difference. Obviously, you know, the fuel economy, you cannot drive that fast, but you, you know, you can see that difference. So those stories are reflected here in this plot nicely. So, which is like, you know, which is really nice. So if you, for your data set, if you plot um, something like this, you know, this, uh, this kind of correlation plot, you might be able to uh, tell a lot of things. Now it makes sense, you know, yeah, this doesn't make sense, but it's it could be true. It's worth exploring. And then you can go to the next step to do your uh, further analysis, your modeling. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasgola. Are there questions at the moment? Okay. Okay, so if there is none, uh, maybe Dr. Kasgola, uh, Please take a break for 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'll do it, but then I'm I'm going to mute myself, but uh, I'll have to, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute me like in 15 minutes. Sure, sure. I okay, will. Then. Thank you. Um, um, so, um, uh, let's get a little introduction of this ggplot. So ggplot is actually there uh, um, for you to get your plotting work done. So just uh, visualizing. So you, you need to understand how to um, do some sort of visualization. This is also not visualizing your analysis results. This is um, again, looking at uh, some of your data without doing um, any um, advanced analysis. So you can uh, plot the results and you know, get different kinds of plots. Um, scatter plots, box plots, bar plots, plots, and um, and then um, numerous oh, plots that... Dr. Kosgola, you haven't shared your screen yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. I I, I have so many, so much in my mind, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Yeah, God, no worries. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so ggplot... Um, Two is actually version two, the ggplot two. So they, um, um, this um, this stands for like you know grammar of graphics. So grammar of graphics is um, actually a um, a framework that's being developed um, 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 uh, for uh, visualization. So you follow um, the that that theoretical framework of the grammar of graphics and then you plot it. So the, the group of um, you know the, the developers that who wrote the code for this ggplot made it easy. You just have to um, add layer by layer of this, uh, the, the data to this plot, uh, whatever that you wanna plot, you know, there's uh, uh, tools that we use uh, in, in layer by layer, like in separate layers and then you can plot it. So uh, I'll explain what these layers means. Uh, uh, layers mean uh, very soon. Um, so, uh, so you have to install the package first, and then um, and then you load it to your environment. Okay. So that's number one. I'm gonna just um, uh, run it as I go. Okay. 
run everything. So first, uh, install the package ggplot2, and then uh, get the library into the environment. Okay, so now it's there. And then um, we'll learn what the basic principles are of gram of graphics, you know, this ggplot. So um, <clears throat> this is actually a, a kind of a systematic way of um, thinking about visualization. So we have um, um, the data, right? So we need to visualize. So first we have to give the data, you know, into the computer, tell, you know, what the data set is, like, you know, what, what is your data set? You have to assign that as an argument, right? And, and then we have to give the aesthetics. So we have to give the mapping of data variables. So you have to say what is X, what is Y, because we may have 100 different variables, right? So you, you need to identify, you know, what, what, what is the X variable, what is the Y variable, and what colors uh, uh, that they are gonna like, you know, uh, be assigned to, um, like uh, the plotting colors. So that's called aesthetics, okay? And then you also have geometry. So you have to identify what type of uh, chart do you need. Are you gonna um, plot points? Are you gonna plot lines? Are you gonna plot bars? Um, you need to just identify what kind of uh, plot that you need. That's called geometries. So you, you just follow this order and then it one by one, layer by layer. So these are the like individual layers, layer one, layer two, layer three. That's why we have this Gramov graphic um, uh, framework added here. Okay, so and then statistics. So statistical transformation applied to the data. So if you're gonna smooth binning and those kind of things that are gonna be the next step typically. And then coordinates, you need to identify the coordinate system. Are you gonna use Cartesian, polar? And, and then um, you have facets. So these facets are the, the, um, the ways of splitting the data into multiple plots. So we have a few examples that we, that we can explore and, and then we'll see how we build the, these things up and you know, get uh, really nice visualizations. So data visualization is extremely important because um, um, you know, visual representation of data you know, tells a lot of stories uh, in a very convenient way. So it is accessible to so many people. So looking at numbers and compare them could be hard, but when you see these um, visualizations, a lot of people can understand, you know, your story is being told uh, in, in, in a very solid way. So that's why data visualization is an extremely um, important, very um, um, focused area that a lot of people are trying to master at. So they try to they try their best to learn the best visualization techniques nowadays. So first one is scatter plot, right? So everybody knows what scatter plot is one of the the most um, fundamental type of plot, right? So um, this just just showing points um, to show the relationship between X and Y. So so we use ggplot function within ggplot2 package, and then first we have to identify the data set, and then this AES is actually aesthetic. Okay, so we are giving what the aesthetics are. So in, in aesthetics, we are assigning what are my X coordinate, you know, what are my X uh, values and what are my Y values, right? So among many other uh, columns, we have to I have to identify what the X variable, that's what I'm doing here, X equals WT and Y equals MPG, right? Um, and that and that is done. So the next thing is we are gonna use a plus sign, go to the next layer. So that is actually um, geo, geo M points. So geo M underscore point. So point stands for the scatter plot. Okay, so they you know, they define scatter plots as you know, geo, geo, geo M points, underscore points. So if you run this, you will see um, 
uh, you, your empty cars, uh, it's going to be uh, plotted uh, in an, an uh, uh, way uh, WT versus MPG is going to be plotted here. So you can see the scatter plot. Um, it's nicely being added here. Okay. And then the next one um, uh, is line plots. So the same thing. So now that we have lines, right? Instead of having lines, um, sorry, now we have dots, right? So you can see dots. Instead of having dots, we can connect these dots and get lines, right? So that's called a line plot. So let's try that also. So it's the same process. You can see empty cars, aesthetic. Um, and then you have um, um, the aesthetic hasn't changed. Only thing that's being changed is right here, geometric underscore line because they're lines, right? So that's the only difference here. See how easy it is? Like imagine like doing this entire program, how to uh, get all the, the, this, like, you know, everything, you know, in this plot. Could be a nightmare, right? So there's a lot of work, but everything is being done as long as we give the correct um, uh, parameters, give the correct arguments and all the correct parameters into your um, plot. That's it, in your, into your function. And here we go. So now you have the same thing in lines. And the next one is bar plots. Um, it shows the distribution of one uh, variable, right? Usually it's a categorical variable. You know, bar plots are um, usually, um, you know, typically uh, drawn for categorical variables to show like for each category, you know, what is the the count. So that's what it represents, right? So now this is um, showing uh, the same thing. It's just like uh, only thing that's changing is right here, geometric, G-O-M underscore bar. Everything else is the same. But here we are only giving the X um, value because this is uh, this 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 is this doesn't have two variables. It's only one variable. Okay, and the you know, y-axis is the count. X-axis is, is the uh, the the factor. So you will see that right here. So you see in the x-axis is the factor, and in the y-axis you see the count. Right. So you can see there's uh, I don't know this number. So I think uh, there's eleven or uh, cars that have four cylinders. And I think maybe there's um, seven cars that have six cylinders. Likewise, you can see, you know, that's just uh, this uh, um, bar plot showing the count, right? The next one is histograms. So, um, so we use here also use we use bars, uh, which shows the distribution of a continuous variable. So we use a histogram. Um, to uh, show the, the distribution of a continuous variable. So in our case, continuous variable is like, you know, MPG is a continuous variable, right? So you can see again, the aesthetic is just um, x-axis. Um, it's MPG. And then geom -E -G -G underscore histogram, right? So this is the only thing that changes. And then you also have to assign the bin width so we bin the, the MPGs, for example. So we just have, um, let's say for example, in empty cars, you can see uh, MPG, right? So 21, 22. So we assign them into separate bins. So one, the first bin could be like, let's say like um, MPG like zero to five. And the next one is like six to 10, right? MPG. And then next one is gonna be like 11 to 15 MPG. Likewise, they are the bins. So we, we identify put these cars into each bin and then you count how many cars are there. That's what this is gonna show you. This his bin width is gonna show you that uh, the, the range that bin is gonna contain, the MPG range, okay? So it's starting from zero, it's going to five and then uh, six to 10. If you, if you select this bin width as five. So that's an argument that you pass to this uh, geometric histogram uh, function. Okay, so we run it. And you can see these are multiple functions added, right? So you can see that's with this function. That's why uh, we use, use them as, you know, um, layers. 
let's run it and here you go so you have the um the histogram here right so with uh, uh, and in, in the x-axis you have mpg and then you in the y-axis you have count so as we can see most of the cars have a an mpg of or like you know, an average like 20 right so there's a lot of them so usually you can also get a you know when you have a continuous variable you know you expect a, some sort of a distribution right you can see you know, what kind of a distribution if it is skewed or if it is a, like a normal distribution so using the histogram you can identify what kind of a distribution that you have okay so that's the beauty of these bar plots so well, usually some of the some um, advanced analysis techniques require you to have a particular distribution right so you need to make sure you have that distribution if not you have to uh, go for um, the alternatives, right? And then you you also can identify this uh, distribution. There's also advanced functions that are available to determine the, the, the ketosis, skewedness, and distribution, you know, what kind of distribution, those things are available, okay? So, but just by simply looking at, if you are doing a basic analysis, simply looking at these bar plots, you can uh, understand what kind of a distribution it is. Okay, so the block box plot. So this is also really helpful. So what we do here is actually we have X and Y both, and we visualize the distribution of a continuous variable using um, quartiles. Okay, so let's see what it does. Um, so again, we have X axis. Uh, so we assign you now X axis as factors um, in cylinders and then y axis in MPG. So let's see what it's going to give us, you know, in the box slot. So this is a box slot. If you look at the box slot, you will see the distribution. You can see the MPG distribution of uh, four cylinder cars. It's going between, you know, like I think it's 22 is the minimum and 30 is the maximum. That's actually in that 25th to 75th quartile. And actually the actual highest value is given by this line. And the actual lowest value is given by this line. So likewise, you can see there's a high range, you know, um, uh, for um, four cylinders, right? That means um, they, um, four cylinder cars have this much of a range of you know, MPGs and then um, average is also high. And then for other cars, you know, six cylinders and eight cylinders, you can see you no know, MPG goes down and their um, range is also decreasing. And we can also identify outliers. So um, you can clearly see in, in eight cylinders one, there's also an outlier here. So those things can be identified without, without you writing any single line of code, you can identify all these things. So this is, these are outliers, okay? So <clears throat> that's the beauty of these things. So now you didn't even ask it to draw all that, right? So we usually in box plots, these things are included, okay? And then, um, so adding titles and labels. So that is also important, right? We have to name them, otherwise people won't understand. I mean, you can see it's already adding these names, but it may not be meaningful, right? So you may have to override. So usually, you know, to, uh, you know, if you if you just run it like this, it's just gonna use these, like, you know, things. This, this is gonna be your x-axis label and this is gonna be a y-axis label, but you don't need that. You, when you do your publication, you submit it to somebody or in, a, in your research paper presentation or your re report, right? Whatever you uh, write, um, present it to people, it should be meaningful, people won't understand. So that's where um, you have to change these things. So you can use um, these um, additional layers to change those things. You can give a title to your um, to your plot using ggtitle function. So with the plus, you see, 
and then you give x lab x lab is x label and then you give a name of the x label and then um, you give the y label uh, here um, miles per gallon um, and then you just run it and you will see all the variable names see scatter plot of mpg versus weight and then you see in the x-axis weight and then in the y-axis you see miles per gallon so this looks like a, a good um, presentable plot that anybody can understand okay so using the themes so there's also a themes you can see like right here um it's already is you know kind of adding a, some sort of a shade to the background of the plot and it's also adding trend lines right so you can use some inbuilt themes there are multiple themes available if you use like theme minimal it's actually gonna like you know be very simple so let's um run it you know just uh this um uh, point geometric points and if you just run it with like a minimum minimum themes you will see um, it's actually getting rid of all the um, um, uh, some of the formatting it it automatically added through ggplot you can actually make it look nicer by using some advanced like you know better um, themes so there's other themes available you can if you go to ggplot uh, um, manual you will find all the themes there okay um dr kosgola there's a question here um yeah. the plots do not appear at the lower right box of their um of their screen but rather it appears separately so how can they make them appear at all at the... uh, they're saying it's appearing separately yeah i think it's popping out as a different screen Hmm. Okay, so you may have uh, to reset your um, uh, uh, view. So I think it that is so also fine. I mean, you can you can actually pop it out. Uh, this is like if it's actually I prefer having it popped out because uh, you know then you can actually like if you right click here, uh, so you can save image right. So you can save it. So save image as and save it somewhere so that you can just uh, copy paste into your uh, research paper. But I don't think if that is a you know, problem. So that is absolutely fine. You know, you have it, but you can all, always reset your um, uh, environment. So um, um, just like how it looks here, it's probably like, you know, not that important. I can do the same. I can just pop it out, you know, in a separate screen, but it's okay. As long as you get it, I, I don't I don't think if it's a problem. So yeah, it's that, just gonna oh, do yeah. it. Oops, sorry to interrupt. Like, is that, what's, is that what publish is for or something? Maybe she clicks somewhere, something in the, in the lower quadrant. So I think you have to um, uh, reset it. So I, I I don't remember now, so you have to reset it. So hold on, okay? So I can, um, uh, you can reset. Um, there should be in settings. You can just reset the no, the the R um, the 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 entire R environment. So I I should be able to. I haven't done it in a while. That's why I don't remember. Um, mm -hmm. I just usually keep it as it is. So, um, but I can like see like weave, go to weaves, and then um, so there should be a reset here. So, like I said before, I haven't done this in a while, so I don't know. But I can I can look into that, and if you are interested, I can look into that and let you know. Okay, but mm -hmm. I don't think if it's a big problem, you know, like I can just. Um, you know, have this maximized and then also like, um, you know, resized. So you can, I mean, sometimes it won't plot if it is too small. So that would be an issue here. So mm -hmm. you got to be careful with that. But yes, yeah, so it should not be a problem. Yeah. So we'll get back to you on that, Matt. So let's Okay, on. yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll take a look at it and let you know. Off the top of my head, I don't remember that. So it should be somewhere here. So I, I'll let you know that, okay? Because I haven't done it actually before. Okay, so let's proceed. 
Um, and um, so this is these are some examples. So let's uh, let's try it out. I might I should have it in there right here. You know, right here in this on this slide, you should see the the entire code. So let's let's try to uh, practice this. Okay. So this uh, visualization. So we can copy paste. Okay, make sure you have ggplot um, package uh, installed um, in your environment, and then you should be able to practice this. So uh, could you please uh, take a few minutes and then try to run these things and then see if you're getting your plots properly? Okay, so I think I also have uh, the other. Um, so this is also part of that. So let's copy paste this uh, one also and then run them. Okay, so this should plot everything. So if I separate, so this is the scatter plot and this is the line plot and um, so this is going to be the line plot and this is the bar plot and clearly and this is the histogram and this is the box plot okay so we are trying pretty much everything here so you should be able to um, see this you know like uh, on your here if you uh, regarding that uh, um, the the screen the the plot screen coming you know popping up Maybe you should try to restart uh, the workspace, close everything, and then um, restart. It might help. So uh, otherwise, uh, you may have to reset the environment. So um, that I, I I will I'll, I'll look into that. I don't want to close anything now because you know we are in the middle of doing this presentation. So next time I'll let you know that. Okay, when we uh, when we meet next time. Okay, make sure when you are done, okay, I then I can proceed. So I'm just gonna wait because I wanna make sure, you know, you can uh, run this and also make sure you understand, you know, what these um, things are. So we don't change a lot between, you know, these plots, you know, you just see what kind of change that we are doing there. So these, these, these plots are plenty. So this is, should be more than enough for you to get a basic, you know, 
um, uh, level of plot. Is there a question, Bana? Um, not so far. Okay. So most of these plots um, are going to be helpful for you, but um, I'm also going to show you a couple of advanced plots, but um, when you're done with this. Okay, um, let's proceed. Um, did you see anything you know, in the chat, Werner? So do you think they're done? None so far. They just said that today is great. So thank you so much to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining. I, I'm so glad you know you are um, learning something from here. That's, uh, that's why I, I am here. Okay, so if there's no more question, we'll we'll proceed. Okay, let's proceed. All right. So um, so let's um let's um dig a little bit deeper into these uh, features and see what else we can do. So faceting and combining plots. So um. So faceting means you know we can actually see like you know different sides of the data by um, dividing into groups. So um, that is going to tell you a little bit like more like you know detailed or um, um, a, a different aspect of your data, which is not um, prominent in that uh, typical regular part that we don't really um, separate anything, right? So. So we can create multiple plots based on the values of one or more variables that we know we've just been the variables and then we see within each bin how things vary. So this could be useful um, to um, really show people, okay, so within this group, you know, let's say for example, um, between men and women, or like, let's say between uh, the these um, different car, like, you know, cylinders sizes. Um, the number of cylinders, right? And MPGs, how things change. So um, that's what faceting is there for. So uh, as we saw in these plots, we can see like it's not bin, right? Everything is there. So, but if we can bin and plot within each bin, so we'll see what's, what happens within that bin. So that's why this um, this is really, this could be really helpful if you are looking at, you know, these subpopulations. For example, you know, like I said before, within one plot showing different subpopulations in each bin and then trying to um, explain what happens within that um, bin, okay? So it's like a different facet. Okay, all right, so facet wrap is uh, the, the function that we use here. Um, so again, um, we are adding that function in the end, um, facet wrap, and then we will tell you know, what is going to be the, um, the variable that we are going to break them down in. Okay, so let's try this. So they're going to they're gonna break, we are going to break them down in like, you know, based on cylinders, right? So you will see um, uh, this function, let's um, go down here. And um, so nothing has changed. We are doing um, a, a scatter plot, the, a similar plot that you see you know, right here, uh, but uh, it will be, um, um, be divided based on the number of cylinders. So that's what it does. So we have to assign the variable 
you know, that uh, that is going to be used for this uh, facet wrap. So within that function. So let's try to execute this. There we go. So now you can see. <clears throat> so we can also um, make it a little bit larger. You can see uh, for um, each cylinder, like you know, four cylinders, uh, six cylinders, eight cylinders, uh, how things change. So MPG and then uh, this WT, actually this WT variable, I don't know what that means. You know, it's something in the cars and I'm not really familiar, but when WT changes, uh, how MPG changes, that's what it says, okay? So you can see for four cylinders, um, uh, it decreases, right? So when WT increases, you can see kind of a trend that decreases. The same trend is there for six cylinders. And also you can see somewhat similar trend for um, eight cylinders. So you see now, so something that we did not see earlier. So now we can see three variables are included in this um, plot, right? Instead of two. What are the three variables? MPG, WT, and cylinders. So that's uh, that's really nice. So you can you can talk a lot about um, your plot when you have these kind of details. Okay, and then you can also use uh, two two facets. Let's say, for example, cylinder and also gear. Okay, so if you do that, it will show. Um, even more advanced, like, you know, that has uh, four variables represented. So it's right here now. So only changes in, we are adding cylinders and then also gear, okay? So there's two variables. There we go. Now you can see um, if I maximize this plot, um, Three, four, five. Um, I think they're the gears, right? Third gear, and three, four, five, right? Number of gears, and then four, six, eight. They're the number of cylinders. And then you have MPG here in the x, uh, y axis, and then in the x axis you have WT. So now you can see MPG WT relationship for cars that have um, three gears and four cylinders and MPG W3 relationship for cars that have uh, four gears and four cylinders. Likewise, I mean, now the, our data is kind of scarce, right? We don't have a lot of data points, but if you have a larger data set, this, this plot is gonna be really informative because this is gonna tell a really big story. So relationship between four variables, right? So you can see how things change, even when, you know, what happens when the number of, uh, um, gears increase. Now what happened to the relationship between MPG and WT, right? So does that change? And you can also see when number of cylinders change, you can also see when you go down in one line, uh, what happens to the MPG versus WT relationship. So this, this a plot like this could be really versatile um, when, you, when you talk about trends, right? Between uh, other variables. Okay, so this could be a really helpful tool for you when you do your analysis. <clears throat> okay, and then I think we are coming to the end, I don't know, probably soon, um, uh, combining plots. So um, now also it's it's important to combine two plots and juxtapose, you know, that means um, in the side to side representation of two plots, then we can compare, right? If you juxtapose two plots, you can see like, you know, um, how they're different, right? So that's also important. So it's, it's a really simple thing that you have to do. You just have to um, add two plots. See, see this layer thing is really helpful in GG plots. Um, because uh, we can just use plus sign to add one um, to, into the other one. Okay, so um, now um, we are going to use this patchwork library so to add two plots. 
So now we have to the first plot here, and then the second plot here, and then the combined plot here. So this patchwork is a library. This is just one out of multiple libraries that you, that says available. This can be done using a lot of uh, other libraries. Okay, there's you will find like a lot of other libraries, but you can stick to this library. But the thing is, you no, know, there could be some other tools that are um, more like you know regularly updated, like you know improved. Some of these packages, some people, you know, they develop it and they never touch it. It's just there. They developed like ten years ago, and it could also be like, you know, maybe incompatible. So uh, it might like not be the best, like, you know, solution nowadays. So that's why it's also nice to like, you know, go search for new tools and then maybe some other uh, advanced tools that you can use. So you don't have to, just because I'm using it right here, you don't need to be stick with it, okay? So you can just um, be flexible with that. Uh, but for this, um, for just for the, the benefit of, uh, I know this program, you can just um, um, stick to this. So make sure you install this library when before you run it, otherwise it may not work. Um, so um, the first plot is actually um, the geometric plot of um, these two variables, WT and MPG. And the second plot, you know, is, the, is actually the histogram um, of, um, MPG. So we we um, uh, juxtapose these two using this combined plot, um, yeah, adding this plot one and plot, plot two. Uh, and for that, we need this uh, library installed. And then you just print the combined plot. So let's run it and see uh, what it's going to give us. There we go. See, it looks nice now. So if you if you have two plots that are like, you know, that can be meaningfully um, compared, they're comparable, then then you can actually tell a nice story by uh, juxtaposing them, right? So this is something, you know, when you write a discussion, this could be really helpful. And also to the viewer, like, you know, in a report, wherever, uh, that you present in a presentation, when you have this kind of a plot side by side, uh, you can tell a lot of things, um, relationships between these plots and it will be really meaningful. Okay. So these are the examples. So now um, let's try this out. Um, so I have this entire code. So I, again, I want you to run this in your environment and make sure it works fine, okay, please. combined plots and then fa faceted plots. Okay, so there's two, um, two examples here. So can you please take a moment, a couple of minutes and run it? Sorry, I didn't copy the whole thing. So again, you have to make sure this package is being installed, okay? So it should be there. So when you run um, this combining multiple plots, uh, that section.
Okay, so <clears throat> now, uh, so if you look at here, so let me show you a couple of things here. So uh, if you can um, uh, look at my screen, so you can see these arrows, right? So if you go, um, you know, if you, you can use these arrows to go between the plots that you created, see? So left and right, you can see your previous plots and the latest plot and everything. And then you can also like export it, you know, save as image or save as PDF, or you can just copy to clipboard and then you can paste it into your presentation or into your Word document or wherever. So you can just uh, copy to clipboard and you just paste it there when you go you, in your document. Um, any of those things should work, okay? So you can also save it as a PDF, whatever the requirement that you have. Um, you know, based on that requirement, you can just uh, select whatever you want to do, okay? I just wanted to show you that also. Okay, so... So yeah, there's a few other things, adding annotations and text uh, to plots. So a um, couple of advanced uh, things you may need to do this, uh, but um, probably rarely. So if you want to put a text there, for example, um, <coughs> if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to add, um, for example, let's say, indicate, you know, where the, the range of high MPG is. So you can do this. So let me go down. And then um, what we are doing here is, you know, we have geometric points. So it's actually uh, the scatter plot. And then you use, we use annotate function, okay? And then <clears throat> it's gonna be text, right? That we are gonna annotate. Then we have to give the coordinate, you know, in you know within the plot, we have to identify, you know, what the coordinate is gonna be, right? X, when X at, at X equals three and Y equals 25, so that is the point where you know, this, uh, this annotation is gonna be added. So it's gonna be a label, uh, which is gonna say it's high MPG and its color is gonna be blue. Okay, so if you run it, you will see right here. So you can see it's being added you know, when X at, at X equals three and Y equals 25. So that means we say, you know, Y, if anything about 25 MPG, you know, it's actually high MPG, right? You can also change it. Like, let's say, no, we'll say it's 30 MPG. And then you run it, you would see, you know, it's going to go to 30, right? So anything about 30, it's going to be um, you know, high MPG, right? And then you can change the color. And then uh, you can change the text however you want to do it. You can do that. And that's uh, called annotation, okay? So um, you use that annotate function. And then <clears throat> um, um, adding a text directly to point. So using geo, uh, geometric text or geometric labels. So let's see how we do that. Uh, so basically um, we are labeling them, right? So basically we are labeling them based on, I know whatever that we have in our data. So for example, Let's see, sorry, I don't know what I did here. I'm gonna select everything. I went to the wrong, click on the wrong thing. Okay, all right. So, um, so now we are adding a text, see, geometric text, right? Above, nothing has changed. It's just the same thing and geometric text. And then you see like, aesthetics, you give you know, the label. Uh, we are using those uh, raw names of empty cars, for example. So we have our um, empty cars um, right here. Um, so this is our data set. Raw names are this, right? Mazda RX4 and Mazda RX4, uh, RX4 VAG. And likewise, those are the raw names. And then we are using them as labels um, uh, and the, for these points, right? So for example, so you see for each X and Y coordinate, um, X is WT and Y is MPG, right? You see the first one. Um, 
WT 2.62 and then MPG is 21, right? So that so then there's a point for this, right? You know, right here. So that point uh, <clears throat> is somewhere here, but we don't know where it is, right? So we can use this row label right here to identify that point, right? Where our car is, Mazda RX for is uh, you know what what is its point right relevant point so that's what we are doing here so we identify that using geometric text and aesthetic is again in you know, we identify you know what you know what what is the the data like that we are using um, so we use the same function here and then um, I think the vertical adjust justification you can justify you know where it's going to be negative one positive one that's what it means here and then the color so if you run it, um, it should show right here, see? So for example, um, let's see <clears throat> this car, right? Fiat 128. So we, as we can see here, if you go down, um, you can see it has um, probably, 2.2 something, 2.2 something WT value. And then we have um, 32 or 33, some um, something for MPG, right? Let's go to the data set and see if it's correct. Yet. See, yes, it's 32.4 and then 2.2. So it is the correct point. So we can label it and then identify, but you can see it is still like, you know, if you have a lot of data, this probably is not the best thing to do. You can see there's label overlapping and everything. So so you may find it hard to, um, to, to understand, but if you make the plot bigger, larger, you can see like it's still, now it's kind of a um, um, little bit better, right? So, but still, um, you know, you can label them like this. That's one thing that you can do. Okay. So. And then we can also customize scales. So um, um, we do this customization um, to adjust the scales for better visualization. For example, you know, the X uh, scale of X, right? So um, if it is um, continuous, we can limit it to one to six. And we don't need, you know, if our data has, let's say like records from like, you know, zero to like 100, we don't want to plot all that, right? So that's not necessary. So we can change, you know, adjust the the uh, the, the scale uh, for x-axis and y-axis. The same way that we do in in you know uh, Excel, right? So then we can just um, focus on our like area, right? So that's what we do here using this scale x continuous, scale y continuous, <clears throat> and then we can also uh, give color, right? So color. So we have to identify what color, you know, uh, the color is defined based on what variable that's needed. So let's um, see how this works. And then I can explain a little bit more about this. Okay, so ggplot, empty cars, and then in aesthetics, you can see now this time we are also identifying an addition and to having x coordinate, y coordinate, uh, x is wt, y is mpg, and then the color is um, um, identified based on uh, the number of cylinders, okay? So you can see the cylinder colors are gonna be red, blue, or green, right? So there's three types of cylinders based on the number of cylinders. You have to identify the number of colors. You may have to give uh, multiple colors based on the number of cylinders. Again, okay, geometric point is the same. <clears throat> and then this is the scale limit for X axis. And then this is the limit for Y axis. So we don't need zero to 10, right? That's why you are setting 10 to 35. There's no cars that have zero miles per gallon, right? So 
Um, so that's why we can uh, skip that uh, smaller, like, you know, anything below 10, we can just uh, eliminate it and get rid of it. And then we can have a better plot. And then we use um, scatter color manual. We color them manually using these three colors. And um, the, the source for those colors is actually cylinders, number of cylinders. And then when you run this, you should get a really nice plot, right? Like this. See, now y-axis starts from 10 and ends at, ends at 35. X-axis going from one to six. So, and also we have colors, you know, the, the, the points are colored based on um, number of cylinders. So, which is uh, nice. We have a really nice plot here. Okay. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> and then you can also change the um, the the text size, font size, and things like that. So this is just showing. I mean, if you go to ggplot, and you might see all these things actually. Like you know, you will see how to change all these things: element, text, um, height, just height size, you know, you can um, access title, plot, uh, text height, and then access title, size, height, and all these things can be adjusted. Okay, so if you run this, you will get a plot. Hold on. All right. Sorry. So if you get, you will get a plot um, that has, um, okay, so hang on. I just have to clean this. There we go, all right. So you will get a plot that has, um, uh, specified size. So for example, let's say axis title size, I'm going to increase it to 20. So it's going to look bigger. You see, it's bigger now, right? And then um, element text, you can, you know, for X axis and Y axis, you can adjust it, let's say like 0.7. So you can see they're bigger now, right? So likewise, you can change. There's lots of other things that you can do that. I'm just showing you like, you know, one out of like, um, hundred things that you can do uh, here. Okay, so it's really helpful for you to um, review that document uh, after going through my you know, slides. And then, uh, then we can um, talk about it later if there's any questions, okay? So this is, um, <clears throat> this is everything, like capturing everything that we have done. Um, so let's uh, do this activity and then um, we can call it a day. Yeah, so please run all these things and make sure you can run them. Okay, all right, so I think everything is fine. So uh, that's all I have for the day. Um, so so next week uh, we are going to go through like, you know, statistical analysis. We'll um, do some testing, you know, regression analysis, hypothesis testing. And um, 
and then we'll like you know the we'll also do some practical applications some um, real world data analysis i'll try to find uh, um, some sort of a data set otherwise i'm going to create a fabricated data set by myself uh, because i may not have access to a, a data set like you know um, what uh, Werner has so but uh, we'll uh, work on that okay and then we'll also look into like you know predictive modeling so uh, we'll see how far we can get into. So I just wanted to um, tell you that you may need to brush up uh, some of your statistical you know, techniques, maybe hypothesis testing, because I may not have time to teach you the basics of statistics, but we are just going to go through um, the, the R um, program. Okay, so I, it would be really helpful if you spend a little time uh, just to make sure you remember um what these things mean okay so but i can just uh, barely like you know, give you a basic introduction of everything but i cannot go into all the nitty-gritty details okay uh thank you so much dr kasgola um, yeah yes yes so and as he as he mentioned so we are now going to the exciting part which is i think what most of you are actually um, came for so the first th this first week the first few days are about basically an introduction data cleaning so before you go to the analysis and everything you need all of this prerequisite and by Tuesday next week okay by Tuesday next week we're gonna see uh, you guys again so um, and I see some comments here that you will uh, please check your spam folder in, in case because we are sending materials syllabus, all PowerPoint presentations. The course outline were all attached to the emails that we sent. So um, kindly check your spam folder just in case it went there. And again, we would like to thank Dr. Pascola for his time and expertise and for being here with us. And if you guys have questions or anything, reach out to Carly, Caleb, or me, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you very much and have a good day wherever you are. Um, I'll yes. send email in a few minutes. So Dr. Tuscola, thank you so much and have a okay. good evening to you and for the rest of you guys, wherever you are in this, in our big cool world. So I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.